Hey YouTube, it's Dwayne here. So today I have another guest with us. Today we're talking to Pastor Matthew Everhard. If you recall a little while ago, if you follow him, you might have seen his video about some reflections on the critical text and the Textus Receptus. And when I saw that video, I just knew that I had to get him on the channel to talk about him becoming a quote CT guy. Brother Matthew, why don't you go ahead and say hello to everybody? What's up, everybody? Thanks for having me on today, Dwayne. Very excited about our conversation today. If you don't know me, I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA, a little church just north of Pittsburgh. If you're Presbyterian and live in Western Pennsylvania, come check us out. Yeah. And you know what? If you're not Presbyterian, go check them out anyway. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So I, I got to put this out there, right? Because you actually ended up on Dr. Riddle's channel and another another one in the sort of King James area. Nick Sayers also talked a little bit about your, your video. So I want to just say that I had actually reached out to you before they had, just we weren't able to get some time together before now. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So brother Matt, let's just get right into it. What is it about the, the critical text that sort of drew you in? What was the best best argument for that side of the discussion? Well, in my video on being a critical text guy, it, you know, it's not necessarily that I was anything else before I was a critical text guy and I made some sort of uh, conversion or decision that actually changed my position, but rather I have grown up and rather assumed the critical text position from very, very early on. So when I became a Christian as a, as a young person, eighth grade, I was reading from modern translations that were translated from the critical text. Uh, when I went to Malone and got my first degree, we used the critical text in seminary. We use the critical text at the doctoral level. We use the critical text. So when I made that video about being a critical text person as a preference for my Greek New Testament, it's not that I made some sort of a landmark decision that changed anything for me. It was rather that I was wanting to make a, a video of a short time, 15, 20 minute video in which I simply laid out some of the advantages to being a critical text reader. And right. one of the advantages that I mentioned in that video is that the critical text has what I would call all of the data or as much of the data as is possible. So when I look at my Greek New Testament, and I usually use the UBS four, which is this one right here. I don't have the five. I use the four is the one we used in seminary back in the day. You know, sometimes I look at the apparatus and I'm just overwhelmed with joy because the apparatus in a critical text has all kinds of information for you at your disposal, at your fingertips. And I love that information and I, I use that information. So for instance, if you're looking at any one particular reading, you can look down at the footnotes and you'll know what majuscules support that reading, what minuscules support that reading. Right. You'll know which of the ancient versions support that reading, which of the church others may be uh, relevant in discerning that particular reading. And so I find that the critical text does an excellent job of just laying out 2000 years worth of Christian history right, for me right. in summary form. Now it's not exhaustive data, no, uh, but in no. summary form, it lays out for me all of the basic things that I want to know as a Bible reader. And so for me, that's probably one of the most important right. things about the critical text. It's interesting. You mentioned that it's not exhaustive, right? Because if you had to actually take a look at some of the other apparatuses that out there, like uh, CNTTS has one, uh, and then the NA28 and the new ECM, right? That's going to make you cry for another reason. There's just so yeah. much information in there. It's, it's it's huge. So before we really, really dive in, I just want to like set out that, you know, we're, we're coming to the discussion with the assumption that we love the word of God, that we are Christians, that we're brothers, that this, this type of discussion, right? It's an in-house discussion, right? This isn't like Christians versus non-Christians. And it's not, I wouldn't even say it's Christians versus Christians, right? Right. And if you if you follow my channel, you know, I, I represent or, or have represented a number of different views on here. And I just think the discussion is neat and we don't need to, you know, get all twisted about it. Right. I, I know Brother Matthew have been watching your channel for a long time. I know that you love the Lord and you have the utmost respect for his word. And uh, you have just simply come to some different conclusions than many others on the channel. So with that being said, can I offer a little bit of pushback to what you just said? Just yeah. push, push. Dr. Riddle pointed this out in his sort of, I don't want, is it a rebuttal? 
his rebuttal to your video and, and Nick Sayers, and, and you said that you have all of the data. To be more specific with that, it's all of the extant data, uh, right? So what you have at your fingertips is all of the data that we know about. Uh, how what, what are your thoughts on that? Or how would you respond to something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. And of course, when I say all of the data, that is a bit of an exaggeration uh, in, in two ways. First of all, um, it would be impossible to have all of the data set before me as though I have it on my desk. Because right. with the New Testament, uh, we have an embarrassment of riches. We have so many manuscripts that it would be impossible for any one human mind to even to collate this information. So for instance, we have over 5,000 Greek manuscripts that are extant. We have uh, numerous editions of the Latin, I think 10,000 or more when you include some of the ancient versions as well, the other languages for which the Bible was translated into very early on. The total comes up to some 24,000 ancient manuscripts. And that is so wonderful because uh, that means that God has preserved his word in a number of different ways, including mm. all of these manuscripts in different languages throughout the church's rich history. So no one human brain could begin to assess all of that information. So in some way we have to break it down into summary form. But when I say all of the data, what I mean by that is that the critical text has the advantage of using some data that would not have been available in previous generations. So for instance, right. you'll find references uh, in a modern a modern translation to the Dead Sea Scrolls or some of the papyruses that have only been recently discovered in addition mm -hmm. to what has been known throughout the previous generations as well. So I think the right, critical right. text does offer that. Hey, can I just go on a tangent for one second though, Absolutely. Duane? Do okay. it. Tangent um, away. I'm just going to go off on a riff here for just a moment. One of the things that I think I believe is that when it comes to Christian unity, I want to foster that as much as possible. In fact, I don't view mm -hmm. myself as a, a combatant in some sort of a pole polemical dialogue between those who hold critical uh, text and those who hold uh, to the TR or the Textus Receptus. I'll tell you this, and I'll just throw this down as a challenge. Yeah, I sure. will preach the gospel out of practically anything that you give me. You give me the Hebrew Old Testament. You give me the a Greek Septuagint of the Old Testament. Give me Sinaiticus. Give me Vaticanus. Give me the Majuscules. Give me the Minuscules. Give me the TR. Give me the King James Version. I'll preach from the New King James Version. I'll preach from the ESV. I'll preach from the NASB or the NIV 1984. Brother, you give me any text you want, and I will preach the gospel from it. I'll preach life and death and hell and sin and judgment and the world to come. I'll preach on angels. Right. I'll preach on demons. I'll preach on grace. I'll preach on the blood of the cross. I will preach on heaven and hell and everything in between. The reason I can do that is because I believe not only in the preservation of scripture, but also in its infallibility, which mm. means that God's word is inspired in such a way that his purposes cannot be thwarted. And so mm. I, I honestly think you could give me any one of those things and I will find find a way to preach Jesus and the cross through anything you put in my hand. So I want to throw that out there. Preach it, brother. Preach it. That's right, man. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. So let's, uh, let's just take a quick second here. We're going to plug your channel. So you have a YouTube channel and you are somewhere around like 18,000 subscribers or something. So you've seen some terrific growth uh, just from the time that I subscribed to your channel. So, so good for you. So go check out their Matthew Everhart's channel or Pastor Matthew. He's got some really good stuff. I'll leave a link below to the video that sort of spawned this discussion. And then I'll leave a link to the other two videos we mentioned where Dr. Riddle and Nick Sayers had responded as well. So you can take a look at the description and see those. There was another video you did about the uh, long ending of Mark. And if mm -hmm. you, if you've taken a look at the history of my videos, it's a topic we've discovered, we've discussed a lot here. So your position on the long ending of Mark doesn't quite match the critical text position. Can, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it does. So if you look up the critical text, the longer ending of Mark is right there. You know, one of the bones to pick, I would suggest about some of the critics of a critical text is they will say that we have certain texts in the footnotes or certain texts that are in brackets as though those brackets mm. were some sort of unbreakable bars that a theologian or a preacher could not possibly get out of, even if he tried. But the brackets in the longer ending of Mark are simply to identify to the reader that there's maybe something unusual about that particular text. And when you go right, to the right. footnotes, it'll tell you exactly what that is. Dwayne, you'll be interested in this. I was just reading the other day, the correspondence between St. Augustine and St. Jerome, their letters that they went back and forth with each other. And there's some interesting stuff in there because St. Augustine is writing to St. Jerome, cautioning him about his new translation of the Bible into Latin, which as we know is 
going to become the Vulgate. And one of the things that uh, Augustine says there in these letters is that Jerome should be very careful to make to make use of asterisks and obelisks to identify any areas where he may be changing the wording from the Septuagint. Now, right. Augustine has a very high view of the Septuagint scriptures. Yes, that is yeah. the, the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament. And he just wanted Jerome to know if you come up with anything that's unusual from the what has been passed down to the church and that the church accepts as the standard, make sure to use a very proliferous use of those asterisk and obelisk to identify to the reader anything that may be unusual. So we actually find this throughout the scribal tradition is that they will often identify certain texts that that maybe there's something curious about them by the use right. of these kinds of highlights. And so brackets to me are no different than a St. Augustine telling Jerome to make sure to mark up any readings that may alert the reader. So I have no problem with brackets. But as to the longer ending of Mark, I actually do believe that the best indication is that Mark probably wrote the longer ending. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually just preached on the longer ending of Mark. So, but I don't think that's a departure from the critical text. There's just those indicators there to alert the reader to further information. What brought you to the point of thinking that Mark 16, 9 through 20 is original and we should not excise that from our Bibles? What Was there like a certain piece of evidence or were you pulling together? together a whole bunch of stuff. What what happened there? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, there's always been a reticence in my heart to strike out portions of scripture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. I know this so, is a scary place to be, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. it is. And there's where I do have some sympathies with the TR guys. I feel your hearts out there, brothers, because I'm not comfortable with that. In fact, we all know the warning at the end of Revelation about either adding or subtracting words Mm -hmm. from the scripture. So adding or subtracting, both of those are, are the two sides of a sword that will cut you very deeply. And so I'm concerned with these things. And so, you know, I've always had Mark 16 in my Bible. It's in my ESV Bible, by the way, also identified with some demarcations there. But when you look up the longer ending of Mark in particular, this is a very interesting text because Hmm. the weight of the manuscripts do absolutely support the longer ending. And I think, you know, as well as many of the viewers may already know that there's really only two ancient manuscripts in which the longer ending isn't found. That's right. Uh, And then you have one, which is more of a a commentary on the longer ending, which also it's not found as manuscript number 304. Other than that, the vast majority of all manuscripts, we're talking 99 plus percent, have the longer ending. Some have some kinds of asterisks and obelisks and things like Mm -hmm. that. Some have the intermediate ending. But if you just look at the evidence, it's pretty clear that that is part of Holy Scripture. Now, you could argue whether or not Mark wrote it. I think there we might entertain the possibility that that another person Person may have supplemented Mark's gospel right. in the same way that uh, Moses died and yet his death and burial are, are described in Deuteronomy chapter 34. That's right. We, yeah. have, we have other books of the Bible too, Duane, in which we know for a fact that there are multiple authors. For instance, the Psalms have multiple authors. The Proverbs have multiple mm-hmm. authors. Yep. Uh, even Paul acknowledges his amanuensis uh, tertius at the end of Romans. So the fact that a, another pen may have taken up and completed the gospel, it does not in itself disqualify it no, from being no. canonical at all. I just happen to believe that that Mark wrote the longer ending and it should be believed and preached. If you're doing anything with the long ending of Mark, uh, you're you're almost invariably going to be drawn to the work of James Snap Jr. I, I'm assuming you read a number of his uh, his articles. He's got a book there. But one of the interesting thing was things was is when we did our when I did my interview with him on the long ending of Mark, we talked about that intermediate reading, and he was able to basically show that that intermediate uh, in, in every single manuscript where it occurs. And I think it was only a handful. It was like six or seven manuscripts. And it can be documented that the way the colophon is written, it comes from the same tradition. So even though it's six or seven manuscripts, it's, it's from the same tradition. Even that intermediate ending doesn't doesn't hold water in much the same way as that the short ending does. But that that's an example of one passage of scripture, right? There's there's two other ones that often get talked a lot about when it comes to textual criticism. And the other one is uh, John seven fifty three to eight eleven, and that's the woman caught in adultery. And then of course the comma you on him, First John five seven and eight. Have you had a chance to look at the Pericope adultery? Yeah, I have. Um, I'll talk about that in just a second, but I sure. do want to 
say though that this, I think some of my positions on these texts are an example of the fact that a critical text person does not have to throw out any baby or any bathwater. Um, it's just a person who wants to read the Greek New Testament and have that kind of data available. Now I'm a little concerned with that in the sense that we don't want to put ourselves as the judge of Scripture, evaluating no. what's in and what's out. I think that's a pretty uncomfortable position. But it, when it comes to even that text there, I would lean towards inclusion in Johannine authorship of that mm-hmm. text. Again, uh, about 85% of the manuscripts do mm-hmm. have that text in there. And so for me, the, the majority of New Testament manuscripts is a very, very weighty consideration that I do not want to easily jettison or dispense. Now, it is mm-hmm. missing in a few other a key of the of the majuscule, some of the more predictable ones that you might expect it not to be in, but it is in the Byzantine majority. Mm-hmm. Um, it is in the Latin Vulgate. It is in several of the uh, of the ancient versions. I think the versions are very important too, because some of the the translations, like the Syriac Peshitta and uh, others, are so early that some mm-hmm. of them themselves are prior to some of our uh, better manuscripts, and so they weigh pretty heavily in my view. But here's where I come down on some of this, Duane. I think that when we use some of these great manuscripts like Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, that they are an incredible wealth of knowledge and information to the church. However, I don't think that their lacking certain texts should be enough to reshape the canon. And so in my view, the primary value of Sinaiticus and Vaticanus is to help us with issues of syntax and grammar, but I'm not comfortable with canonical level shiftings of the text. Right, in my right. view, uh, both uh, the long grand of Mark and this uh, section, the PA from John, if you were to exclude them, it rises to the level of almost a canon change to me because you're taking out a major right. section of a piece of scripture that has been assumed throughout most, most of church mm-hmm. history to be authentic. Now you have enough anomalies there that you certainly have to ask a lot of questions. How yeah. did that happen? But I think that James Snap's explanation of how the lectionary may have maneuvered that text do explain for me satisfactorily how it might have become this floating text that in a few manuscripts, it appears in different places from time to time. But Duane, the uh, the philosophical principle of Occam's razor, which is the idea that the simplest explanation is usually right, all things considered. I think Occam's razor suggests that Mark probably wrote the longer ending. It's in the mm-hmm. preponderance of manuscripts and that the PA is canonical. Also, that seems to, to satisfy my logical desire and curiosity to know. I, right, think, right. I think it's just the best explained by the fact that it's it's in the most places. It's legitimate. Mm-hmm.